On the 4th of August 1914, the Liberal government, which had been in power for nine years, more or less, was faced with the decision of whether to act on the plans that they had secretly engaged with, with the French in the Committee of Imperial Defence in 1911, and embark the British Expeditionary Force to northern France to deal with the advancing German army as they unfolded the Schlieffen Plan. The consequences of the decision to actually go through with that over the next couple of days in the cabinet have often been seen as having a cataclysmic effect on the party that took that decision. A party whose liberalism was indeed to be challenged over the ensuing four years. In 1914, the Liberals were in government, although by then, as a result of by-election losses, they had fewer MPs than the Conservatives. If it's any consolation for them, the Labour Party, in by-elections between the general election of December 1910 and August 1914, had done even worse. So in some ways, the Liberals looked like they were in robust health. Back in 1936, the American historian George Dangerfield, in his The Strange Death of Liberal England, suggested that nonetheless that there were the seeds of decline already there. Indeed, if you think about it, the Liberals only won outright one general election after 18 85. Really, because that was a, such a close election, they only at one outright one election after 1880. So you could argue the Liberals had been long term in decline. But there was no sign on that August day that this great party was about to collapse, not as a political party, but as a party of government. This has led a number of historians to take the view that it must be the Great War which destroyed their ability to hold on to, to gain and win power. Their ability, and of course this is central to that, or to win the support of sufficient of the electorate in order to gain the majority at the general election. Whether it was indeed the Great War which did it for them is the question I'm going to be addressing in this lecture. There are, I would argue, four major factors which shape the electoral politics of interwar Britain. These are in no particular order. The high politics of the period, the relationship between the two, the, the parties which structure the way in which the political marketplace behaves and therefore the false choice presented to electors. Do you vote for this party or this party? Secondly, the electoral um, geography, where people vote, how people vote, the, the local characteristics and boundaries which affect voting behaviour. Thirdly, and relatedly, the electoral sociology, including changes in identities. For instance, it used to be argued, perhaps more than it is now, that there was a shift towards a more class-based system of voting around the time of either the Edwardian period, you look at some of the work of Peter Clark in the 1970s, or in the immediate aftermath of the First World War, 
articles by Ross McKibben in the past as well, um, that led to the emergence of a class-based voting system. Fourthly, and perhaps most importantly for this lecture, there's the question, or the factor, which I've called contingent events and or trends. And obviously the war, the first total war experienced in this country, bulks very large as just such a contingent event which might impact upon people's propensity to vote for one party or another. So, but if that's the case, we need to think about, well, what might be the factors that would lead people to be less inclined to vote Liberal and more inclined to vote for other parties instead? What are the factors which might incline new voters and at the end of the war getting on for two thirds of the electorate are new um, to vote for parties other than the Liberal Party? And is it about how the war is handled, how the party develops or fails to respond to the war? Is it about what other parties do to reposition themselves in the electoral marketplace as a result of the war itself? So the war has a number of clear effects upon the party system. Firstly, of course, you've got large numbers of people at the front. One of the consequences of that is that you have electoral registers which form into decay. The registers are increasingly meaningless. Now, in the pre-war system, voting, where you voted, was really important. Indeed, you had to be living in a constituency for a year to get onto the electoral register. Obviously, if you're in northern France, that's not a possibility. So one of the consequences of the war is that through no fault of their own, large numbers of men who had the vote before the war now are unlikely to. The result is that there is a conference convened by the Speaker of the House of Commons in 1916, which looks at not only this issue, but on the back of that, a wider question of electoral reform. This involves looking at all kinds of aspects of the voting system. Indeed, one of the things they look at is the introduction of proportional representation, which in Britain at the time, and indeed at any time up until the 1970s, effectively meant the single transferable vote. It also involved tacking on to the resulting legislation passed in early 1918, the idea that women should at last acquire the vote at the parliamentary level. All of this gets rolled up into the Representation of the People Act 1918. The second effect of the uh, war is that Parliament continues. And the shift towards Parliament only having five year terms had only been introduced in the Parliament Act of 1911. And it's immediately overturned. The Parliament Act, uh, elected in December 1910 lasts until December 1918. This means that you've got large numbers of people who have not been socialised into voting for one party or another. You've also got a whole load of people who've never voted before the war because they were too young. Many young people 
even if they were above the age of voting because of where they lived, if they lived with their parents, for instance, couldn't vote before 1914 anyway, the result is that you have a whole new generation, quite apart from the women, who have never been socialised into voting for the Liberal Party. But of course, this is also a factor which affects the other two parties as well, the other two major British based parties, the Conservatives and the Labour Party. So one of the issues that this raises is, did the Liberals respond as an organisation to the effects of the war less effectively than its main political rivals. On this point, it's usual to highlight the split in the Liberal Party which takes place in December 1916. What happens in brief is that the government changes. Government had started to change in May 1915, when in the face of what was called the Shell Scandal, a public furore about the uh, army on the Western Front being left, sh allegedly left short of shells, uh, because of inefficiencies in the War Office, the Liberals ceased to have a single party government. They set up a coalition. They called the Conservatives and indeed the Labour Party into coalition. They retain the lion's share of the cabinet posts and they retain all the most important ones. The leader of the Conservative Party becomes colonial secretary which is not the most important position in the government. The, scan, the, the um, consequence is, however, that you now have Conservatives embedded in the government, Labour embedded in the government, and you start to get intro, uh, rivalries between those parties taking place over war policy. And those rivalries also lead to increasing conservative discontent with what they see as the somewhat dilettante approach to managing the war of the existing Prime Minister Herbert Asquith. The result in late 1916 is a proposal to reconstruct the cabinet so as to have a small tightly knit war cabinet which will drive the war forward. This is something that has been repeatedly attempted since the start of the war and every single time that the cabinet committee created had grown and grown as more and more people found excuse to come along to it and Asquith had not stopped that happening. The view that you needed some kind of decisive man of action to manage this process gathered and was sedulously encouraged in uh, certain parts of the press, not least the uh, Times, owned by Lord Northcliffe, and there's more than a suspicion that the man of the hour who saw himself as the man of the hour, David Lloyd George, who'd become Minister of Munitions, the man who saw the shell crisis, um, was planting stories in the Times in order to uh, further his own interests in all of this. This was certainly what Asquith suspected in the messy process whereby Asquith resigned 
found himself out on his ear and Lloyd George became Prime Minister at the start of December 1916. Lloyd George convening a much smaller cabinet committee and running it increasingly as a kind of duumvirate between himself and the Conservative leader Andrew Boner Law. So the Liberals split at this point in time, but then of course the Labour Party split in 1914 between those elements who were, if you like, patriotic Labour, supported the war committedly throughout the conflict, and those elements who had been active in the uh, group which remained a kind of party within the party of the Labour Party, the Independent Labour Party, founded in 1893, who stuck with its pacifistic line towards conflict. So Ramsay MacDonald, leader of the Labour Party in 1914, Keir Hardy, the, the man who in many ways was a key founder of both the ILP and the Labour Party. Philip Snowden, who uh, was a key figure in the ILP. All of these leading Labour figures opposed the war, um, with the consequence that they tend to lose their... Well, Keir Hardy dies in 1915, but the rest of them lose their seats in 1918. This split in the Labour Party doesn't seem to have been as important as the split in the Liberals. So one of the things we need to think about is why. The classic statement that the Great War was, as he put it, the rampant omnibus which did away with the Liberal Party is Trevor Wilson's 1966 book, The Downfall of the Liberal Party. If you look at the Liberal electoral fortunes, you see that in December 1910, they win about 100, 270 seats. And December 1918, they win about a tenth of that figure if you're looking just at the Asquithian Liberals. If you look across the Liberal Party as a whole, it's a slightly different. So if you add the two contingents of, contingents of the Liberals together, those who followed Lloyd George and stayed with his coalition government in 1918, and those who followed Asquith into opposition and in Asquith's case defeat, in 1918, you have something like 150 MPs. You have something like 26% of the vote. In both respects, they're still ahead of Labour. But they're also, or rather a large percentage of them, are in the clutches of the Conservative Party. If you look at the run of election results from 1918 onwards, and we have a whole series in 1922, 1923, 1924, you can observe that the Liberals are still able to get over 100 seats in 1922, 1923. They're still able to get within touching distance of the Labour Party in both of those elections. In terms of electoral results, it's the 1924 election when they're unable to uh, run anything like a full slate of candidates, running three elections in a row is hard work for a party which is struggling to get finances and they're reduced to a rump of about 40 seats. Arguably it's 1924 
which expresses the coup de grace for the Liberal Party. But that's not to say that Wilson's rampant omnibus hadn't already fatally wounded them and left them in a state from which they would find it difficult to recover, given the behaviour of the other parties, other two parties in competition to them. So we need to go on to consider such issues in order to properly answer this question. What made it worse was the way in which the government responded by prescribing those Liberals who voted against the government. Those Liberals didn't go quietly away into the wilderness. They followed Asquith into opposition with the consequence that you had Liberals standing against other Liberals in a number of constituencies in 1918. You had Liberals being overwhelmed by um, Tories in, uh, on Liberal votes in traditionally Liberal areas because people were voting for a government in which the coalition Liberals and the Tories were in cahoots. The consequence was that the Liberal organisation is not only affected adversely, but also the Liberal political identity is adversely affected in 1918. But this is about, of those four factors I mentioned earlier, the consequences of high politics as a result of the war, not because of the war itself. Another indirect effect of the war, which has often impressed historians, is the idea that the franchise factor in 1918 has a major influence upon the decline of the Liberal Party. After all, more working class, although not majorly more working class, it's certainly younger and there does seem to be a generational effect. There's a number of people who haven't voted before and the idea is that they're differentially less likely to vote Liberal than their forefathers, or their fathers or grandfathers who stuck with the party arguably that they'd always supported. And to some extent you can see this generational effect starting to happen before the First World War. So you can see younger trade unionists in the 1890s and the Edwardian period are moving towards socialism and moving towards more um, militant forms of labour organisation and thereby what you can see, arguably, is a shift to the left, except, of course, it doesn't work like that. Because if you look at the elections of the interwar period, the party which wins the most votes in every single one, 1918, 1922, 1923, 1924, 1929, 1931, and 1935 is the Conservative Party. So if we're suggesting that there is that it's as simple as this is a shift to uh, the left, a rise of a working class vote, we need to somehow explain that. It's obviously more complicated than that. On the other hand, this is a much larger electorate. If you're going to organise that electorate, you need more people. You need large effective organisations, you know, large effective constituency associations, you need money, you need resources in terms of posters, leafleting, etc, etc. Being split into two parties really doesn't help you do that. You also are now facing 
greater upfront cost because you've got to give a deposit in order to even stand on the ballot paper and £150 is a lot of money in 1918. So all of these factors arguably are incremental ones which don't necessarily help the Liberals in these new circumstances or perhaps work more in favour of their political rivals. So if electoral sociology, the role of class in 1918, can be overstated as a factor in the decline of the Liberal Party, maybe it's electoral geography where people voted that is instead the more significant factor. If you look at the quote from Duncan Tanner on this slide, you'll see that he's trying to map where Labour did better than the Liberals. So what we can see here is that Labour is gaining ground in a number of areas, particularly in areas where the Liberal Party had always been relatively weak anyway. And you might argue that in part is a long-term consequence of the Macdonald Gladstone Pact in 1903, whereby the Liberals, looking at the million or so voters that the that Labour could put in the field through the affiliation of their trade unions, decided that they would give Labour a clear run in a number of seats which they didn't really expect to win anyway. The consequence was that in some areas you're already getting a development of a Labour vote and you're already getting at local level a shift from anti-Tory politics, a progressive alliance politics, which is encapsulated in that whole idea of the Macdonald Gladstone Pact, to instead an anti-Labour politics. And the coalition may have started out as um, a coalition of convenience between the two parties which were the dominant partners in the government which led the country to victory as it were but it also over the ensuing four years between 1918 and 1922 adopts something of the character of an anti-labour alliance particularly for a number of its members. And that's one reason why people, many people in the Conservative Party are willing to stick with it. In 1918, Lloyd George has the reputation as the man who won the war. He's supported by Bona Law into that election. He is the dominant figure. He sees, as the quote from Robert Rose James here, um, the Conservatives as needing him as much as he needs them. This is despite the fact that the Conservatives in 1918 are on their own a majority of the House of Commons. But they stick with Lloyd George and they stick with him until October 1922. During that time, Lord George tries and fails to set up a effective coalition liberal organisation. He try he explores merging with the Conservative Party and fails in that as well. The result is that 
the coalition liberal identity gradually diminishes and his followers either start drifting back towards the uh, Liberal Party uh, itself, still under Asquith. Some of them indeed jump ship completely and move to the Labour Party and others like Winston Churchill in the end, after a couple of years in 1924, find themselves members of a Conservative government. So the split in the Liberal Party isn't healed. The organisational difficulties are not resolved and the Liberal Party um, goes into the 1920s without a clear identity, a clear agenda, a clear sense of what its role is in an electoral politics which now resolve, revolves increasingly around debates about capital and labour. And those debates about capital and labour also work towards making on the right of politics the centre of the debate the Conservative Party. And you can see this happening at local level. Going around the chapels of West Yorkshire, a former stronghold of liberalism in uh, 1919, an eminent Baptist minister was told by uh, one of uh, the people he was talking to, well, uh, when he preached on brotherly love, well, we're all practicing brotherly love in uh, in the local elections. The Conservatives and the Liberal Party show the greatest of brotherly love towards each other, but I'm afraid neither of us like the Labour Party. What you start seeing as a result of this is local electoral pacts between Conservatives and, and Liberals to keep Labour out. And in most cases, the larger, more numerous, wealthier party is the Conservative Party, with the result that they're the ones who become the dominant partner and the Liberals thereby go into decline. So we could argue that what we see is the Liberal Party atrophying on the ground more than it does uh, at the level of being able to return MPs to Parliament. This slide ne neatly illustrates two of the things I've just been talking about. So on one side of the slide you have what was called the coupon. This was the derogatory term used to describe the letter of endorsement sent by the two party leaders, Lord George and Bona Law, to various people in order to say, you are the official coalition government candidate in this constituency. Some Asquithian Liberals get the coupon, some do not. Most of the people who are couponed in 1918 are Tories. The rally round the flag effect of the 1918 election, an election which um, in some ways is a kind of classic khaki election, very low turnout, lots of people who were in the army have still not been demobbed, so they're not able to vote. The uh, electors had a terrible scare when Ludendorff broke through early in the year. And one of the consequences is that that scare then turns to anger, particularly when the war ends much more suddenly than anyone expected, including members of the government in November 1918. So the war is to some extent fought within an atmosphere of national, uh, sorry, the election is to some extent for within an, uh, an atmosphere of nationalistic patriotic fervour in which simply endorsing the uh, government which has allegedly won the war is in 
many ways sufficient to ensure your uh, safe return to Parliament. On the other side of the slide, we have uh, one of the Labour posters from 1918. It's perhaps not the greatest of political messages, but the story that is presenting mothers make the world safe for them, make the world safe for children. Voting for peace, for the war weary, is a clear and distinctive message. In many areas, partly because the Asquithian Liberals do not have enough candidates, your only choice to vote against the, uh, the government is to vote Labour. And thereby hangs a tale, because in 1914, Labour was struggling in the two elections of that year to get more than 100 candidates for a parliament which has more than 600 members. If that's the case, you're clearly not a party of government because you are not in a position to form a government. The study that Duncan Tanner did of the um, planning in the party for the general election, which was due to be held by 1915, also suggests that they wouldn't have run many more candidates. This is where we come back to a different effect of the First World War particularly after the Liberal Party split between Lloyd George and Asquith in December 1916, we see the trade unions, the people who provide the money to get Labour going, being much more willing to front up that cash in order to run a campaign, run propaganda, actually finance MPs properly. You see the cooperative party, the, 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 the party associated with the cooperative movement, moving in to coalition with Labour at the end of the war on similar grounds. You see the uh, Labour Party reconfiguring its own organisation in the last year or so of the war particularly as a result of what happens in 1917. Arthur Henderson, Secretary of the Labour Party and member of the War Cabinet, in the summer of 1917 wanted to go to Stockholm to meet with various representatives from socialist parties from around Europe including German ones. He was refused permission to go by Lord George and he resigns from the cabinet. He goes back to organising the Labour Party and as a general secretary and he is instrumental in two major developments. Firstly, the party is reorganised so that you can be an individual member of the party. This had not been possible before the war. You had to be a member of an affiliated organisation. Secondly, the party is reorganised on a constituency basis. Instead of looking like a coalition of interest, the Labour Party starts to look more like a, a normal party. Um, and it's organised so that it can fight on a constituency by constituency basis. Then with Sidney Webb he drafts the party co uh, con uh, constitution which is promulgated early in 1918 um, and which establishes a clear message of what the Labour Party is about. He also, in 1918, embarks on 
a major press campaign, particularly in hitherto liberal supporting newspapers, to present the Labour Party not as the sectional party of the working classes and the trade unions, but as a national party interested in raising the well-being of the community as a whole, the workers by hand and by brain. The result is that Labour go into the 1918 election in much better shape than they were in 1910, and arguably in much better shape than the Liberals were either. 1918, however, was not the breakthrough or the decisive moment in the decline of the Liberal Party. Arguably, nor was the events in the Carlton Club in October 1922, where the, when the Conservatives, buoyed by a by-election victory by an independent Conservative in the working class Welsh constituency of Newport, to a large extent around issues of alcohol, decide to withdraw from the coalition. Some Conservatives, people like Austin Chamberlain, son of Joseph Chamberlain, are very reluctant to break with Lloyd George. They see a need for the two parties to cooperate to keep Labour out. Other people, the majority of the party who support Bona Law returning from illness to smash the coalition, see this as an opportunity to have a clear fight of Labour versus anti-Labour, with them representing anti-Labour and them therefore able to reap the electoral benefits. The Conservatives in the interwar years create a grand electoral coalition of a structure around patriotism, a belief in the empire, moderate reform and uh, resistance to the supposed threat posed by socialism, which enables them for most of the time to remain in power and certainly keeps them as the dominant political force of that period. The Liberal Party within this process, which in the book shown on the slide here, Morris Cowling, The Impact of Labour, published in 1971, argues is an exercise in high politics. The Liberal Party in this um, setting finds themselves increasingly with nowhere to go. That doesn't mean that they don't retain a position within Parliament. In the 1929 election, they can still return 59 seats. But increasingly, these are in rural seats and they do best when they're not involved in a three-way conflict. They win far more seats in rural areas in 1923, partly because a lot of the rural seats they're taking from the Tories, uh, largely on uh, agricultural issues in the wake of a foot and mouth outbreak, and discontent with the, government, uh, with the Tories' agricultural policy, they win far more seats in 1923 when they're having straight fights with the, the Tories than they are able to in 1929 when Labour is for the first time really contesting seats in rural England. The result is that the Liberal Party by the end of the 1920s is really atrophying. Indeed, in uh, Chris Cook's book shown 
on the slide here, the age of alignment, he points out that by the end of the 1920s, they have not much more than a hundred councillors left. So the, in other words, the Liberal Party has really declined at local, even more than it has at national issue, at uh, national level. <sighs> to conclude, though, we need to work out well what were the key factors in this process. One can concede that the First World War has a role to play in all of this. But it seems when you consider the range of factors not to be the rampant omnibus that Trevor Wilson describes. After all, it's not so much the war itself but the decisions, the non-decisions, the bad decisions that liberal leaders and their political rivals make, which reposition the parties within the electoral marketplace, within the changed electoral marketplace of post-war Britain. The way in which the liberals handle the war and handle themselves during the war makes it more difficult to, for them to respond to the changed landscape of the post-war period. They don't come up with policies for dealing with class based issues, for dealing with the conflict between capital and labour. They certainly don't come up with distinctive ones which can be readily associated with their party. The result is that, as one Liberal MP puts it, one of the few who manages to get elected in the 1930s, the party looks like a sheet which has been torn down the middle with both the other parties claiming to some extent that their legatees, that they share in the legacy of the Liberal Party, but the Liberal Party itself no longer represents liberalism. Thank you.